Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the hardcore legend, Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I'm doing great, and I think I just came up with a keeper. Really? Uh, we all know uh, Gorilla Monsoon is, uh, he will live on forever because yes. of the gorilla position. Yes. So we have the Grillo position. Okay. Right back there behind the camera, taking it all in. I like it. Yeah, that's right. I like it. And the real name again is? Dave Silva. Uh, I'll never remember that. Just no. <laughs> <laughs> the real story we should just catch everybody up on. Mick had been to Huntsville, I don't know, <laughs> half a dozen times. And every time as we walked into the studio where we're shooting the back of the office goes, now, what's the really nice guy behind the camera's <laughs> name again? And I would remind him and he could tell it just whisked right through <laughs> one ear and out the other, gone. And the next week, the same thing. Now, what's the really nice guy behind the camera's name again? <laughs> I feel bad for asking. So eventually, he just started calling him Grillo, and we all went with it. And I think a few weeks went by before Mick realized or remembered, wait, that's not really his name. It just reminds me of a but guy by named that Grillo. Time, uh, Mr. Silva enjoyed being Grillo. And he still is. is. There's a guy in uh, That's Ontario. his dude love, by the way. <laughs> That's his dude love? That's his other persona. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a gentleman I met through the great Owen Hart. We spoke out at length. And he reminded me of my friend Rob Betcher's father, Bruce. So I have not only called him the wrong name for 30, for 26 years, it's been the same wrong name every time. And when I finally got his name correct, he was a little disappointed because in his heart he was bruce i love it yeah i love it so there yeah, you go yeah there you go grillo so uh since we're talking about um maybe faux pas and what have you maybe some of our listeners oh as we're supporting that young upstart dwayne johnson's healthiest of all the energy drinks possible i have to ask yeah. are you wearing the same thing that you wore last week well i think i am I think I am, Conrad. Uh, it would be tempting to leap to the assumption that we are just doing back-to-back -back podcasts. No, no not, not us. No, not us. Not us. Uh, but I will say, now this gives me an opportunity to badmouth a legend in our business. Okay. Good for rating. I love that. Uh, we try to take people on a pleasant stroll down memory lane. Usually. Non-combative. But I do voice my opinions. Mm -hmm. In this case, this is a beloved, ultra-respected member of our uh, extended family whom I'm about to lambast uh -oh. while dropping the name of one of the uh, brightest stars in the business. Uh, Cody Rhodes shared with me a story in which Arn Anderson was being interviewed. And the interviewer, probably out of respect for Arn, opted not to tell... Arn Anderson, that he looked like he just dined on an Enterman's crumb cake and that many of the contents were still on his dark shirt. And that can be distracting. Yes. So I noticed that when I was, probably the uh, the guys in in, uh, in <laughs> audio, I was about to say the guys in hearing, like that's <laughs> part of the hearing team. It sounds like... <laughs> New York Times yeah. bestseller, ladies uh, and gentlemen. The guys in the hearing. Uh, remember Les, I don't know, I'm older than you. Les Nessman didn't have a chopper on WKRP in Cincinnati, so he just went, oh, we were flying. He would, he would sound like that. That was his yes. chopper. So it probably sounds like I'm on a chopper by the amount of times I try to swat the crumbs off of my own dark shirt. And I just thought, there's one way to ensure that doesn't happen. Tie-dye. And is. then the Santa shirt, it's got the stars in it. You'd be hard pressed to tell the difference between the stars and the beard dandruff. So that's the idea. So, do you think that's why the Dudleys went with that look all those years? Beard dandruff? It's up there, sure. Yeah, let's yeah. get that on yeah. all the sites. Okay. Um, this is YouTube. These are going to do cornet numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's his primary gig. Well, he calls he's a out YouTube superstar. Arn Anderson. And, and the thing about it is, probably no one wanted to hurt Arn's feelings. In order not to insult or embarrass Arn in front of four people, he will go down 
in history as having the Enterman's crumb cake. <laughs> Speaking of Cornette, I remember sitting with Corny at a Kentucky area um, independent show at a fair. And Kentucky won't allow you even in the ring unless you've been licensed. So I have to do my promo at the table with Jimmy. And we're watching and we're kind of reminiscing. There's a good old fashioned, you know, heat getting first match heel. We're kind of, like, you know, bemoaning the fact that those guys, there's not many of them out there anymore because everybody wants to steal the show. And that's understandable. Yes. But there's still a place for the old fashioned, heat getting, taunting guy. You know, you can't have a whole card of guys doing mic work on individuals. But uh, we were feeling pretty good. And I love Corny. And I was feeling comfortable enough in my own skin to order a funnel cake. And basically, when you agree to be in public eating a funnel cake, knowing you're going to be wearing a lot of it, you no longer care what society thinks about That's you. That's fact. And that was, a, that was a very liberating feeling. So thank you, Jim Cornette, for being part of that special moment with me. Uh, I, I do want to bring up a topic that Mr. Cornett's probably touched on quite a bit lately. Uh, you and I talked a little bit off air, not a ton. So I thought, Hey, everybody else is talking about it. Maybe we should. What do you think of this whole, uh, CM Punk, Tony Khan, mm. AEW, a steel young bucks. What do you think of that whole mess? And you know how we, we got into it wasn't heated but it was spirited conversation about uh roman reigns and whether the title should have been dropped yeah at clash of the castle clash of the castle i feel like roman needs to hold on to that title until wrestlemania if they get rocked that's great if not maybe that's the time for him to drop it but the bottom line is that title's so meaningful so to me Anything that takes away from the joy and the prestige of winning that title is, it's counterproductive. Yeah. So if Punk is on camera and he's not filled with joy and he's letting bitterness and anger come out, I think that detracts from the title. I understand that when you do these uh, press conferences, we're asking people sometimes to read between the lines, even on Talking Smack. And there was that great angle that's not necessarily an angle, but a real character builder for The Miz with yes. Daniel Bryan. To this yes. day, I don't know if it was worked. I don't want to know. Like, we understand we got to throw a little spice on the recipe that maybe traditional sports don't have to. But I think anything that takes away from the, the really the majesty of that moment is counterproductive. And by that standard, Everything Phil did, Punk did, was disastrous because because it put Tony Khan in a bad position. Anything that ends up with, uh, you know, Punk, I believe, was uh, hurt and would have probably been out. Yeah. But it just it it put a lot of eyeballs on the product the next night. That's a, that's a given. I, it was just really unfortunate. You don't want to see that side of of your your superstars, and I just think it's a yeah, I can't, you know, I, I know when I held that title aloft when I beat this this guy um, for the WWE title. I never thought I was a WWE title guy. So I never based my career on it the way that a lot of people have. Right. But I remember that feeling of just utter joy. You know, I moved pretty good for a big guy when I ran my two or three laps yeah. around there and then gave the impromptu promo, Big Daddy O did it. I can't imagine going backstage and being angry or bitter or taking the joy out of the experience for our fans. And so I didn't see uh, Punk's promo in its entirety, but it put Tony Khan in a bad position. And you don't want to make pe – there's a time and a place maybe to play with emotions. And, and if you have something substantial that can make people feel strange in their gut, but not after a title win. You know, I just, I, man, I just, I, I didn't like seeing it. I don't like people uh, who, I, I know Ace Steel going back many years. I know he's just trying, you know, watch Punk's back, but that wasn't good for, for business. I mean, it might pay itself off in some way, but no, nah, I think it was unfortunate and sad. And it was uh, a bad statement about the prestige of that title that anything 
could be so meaningful that uh, it took center stage over a title victory. Um, as we're recording this, because uh, we definitely didn't record them back to back. No, hell no. But as we're recording this, the rumor and innuendo is that um, it's going to be a two week suspension. So by the time folks hear this, maybe uh, the young bucks and the elite are back. Of course, we all know that punk had surgery. Um, but Ace Steel, uh, Dave Meltzer is speculating, he can't imagine would be back in AEW. But I think in a weird way, more people probably know about Ace Steel than ever before. Ever before, yeah. So he's going to be hotter than ever, you know, as a as a free agent. Yeah. And there's a phrase these days about uh, that the kids are using uh, about a guy who, uh, he's a scrapper, he's a fighter, he's fearless. Uh and I think it fits a steel. He got that dog in him. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to referee uh, some Aces matches. I hardly used him sometimes. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Foley is the referee. You know, basically there's a sock involved, the presentation. And, and he was a good indie wrestler. That was a long time ago. I don't know what he's got left in the tank, but the fact that we're talking about Ace Steel. It's a big deal. Big deal, yeah. But still, I go back to that title and taking people out of that moment. And I'm just, uh, when they're in that moment and they want to be there for the ride and celebrate with you, it's uh, it's just counterproductive to take them off that, uh, that ride. We know that uh, Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart had a, a situation in June of 1997. Uh, I believe it's referred to as the hair pulling incident. <laughs> Uh, where Sean wound up saying it was an unsafe working unsafe environment working and quitting environment, the company yeah. and eventually cooler heads prevail and it came back. Do you remember there being other circumstances like that where this isn't an angle, there's no TV cameras rolling, these guys legitimately have an issue with each other and there's going to be some physicality in the backstage oh, area? Man, over the years there have been, I guess everywhere I've gone, there's been a few back uh, backstage brawls. But for the most part, Given the fact that, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of big dogs competing in that yard. Like, there's a lot of alpha males. Yeah. It's just a strange, uh, it's a strange collection. Uh, and I think I wrote this when I did the review of The the Wrestler, the movie, for Slate.com. It's like this collection of athletes, alpha males, dreamers, artists, so that you have a cross-section of different people who were in it for different reasons. But there's a lot of big, strong guys yeah. uh, vying in a very competitive world who travel together, spend a lot of time together, may or may not have along the way have had some um, help <laughs> chemically in ways that are supposed to make uh, anger levels uh, more quickly to accelerate. Uh, talking about you know roid rage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And given all that, I think we have a remarkably, I agree. You know, harmonious world. It surfaces once in a while, but not necessarily any more than it would in any business where guys spend that amount of time together. You know, I think it's amazing that we don't have more of those brawls. And you get some harsh words sometimes when someone feels like. Uh, you know, their body hasn't been protected or respected afterward or where a match doesn't go according the way you would like it to. Um, but by and large, I think we do pretty well. I think we do pretty well, given all the intangibles. Does this circumstance remind you of anything you've come across in wrestling? <sighs> well, it was unique and you had the two biggest stars in the company and one of them using a reference that you know, you, that was a line that should never be crossed you know um when brett found out the the you know the crux of it is crux of it uh, can we look that up yeah, yeah uh he was i think he was really angry that was going to make his li sunny days comment was going to make his life more difficult at home um and so there was that. I remember I didn't see it, but I heard about it. Brett's gone. I mean, Sean's gone. Said I remember Sean yelling, this is an unsafe working atmosphere. And he was gone. And uh, of last week, where I was dressed identically to this week, I did, I'd mentioned to you that I did look at the notes, but then I, I, I don't want to know. Yeah. I'd rather answer them. 
uh, organically. But there was a note asking me when I was given the news about uh, who would have broken the news, uh, or this actually might be this one, uh, 97. Uh, no, no, it would have been 96 because I would have gone from Undertaker and now I've got that month off. Uh, I got September without Undertaker before I go back to Buried Alive, which I think was always the plan to mm -hmm. uh, take a month off and then uh, regear and, and go back hard into that angle. And at first it was Mark Marrow was scheduled to be my opponent. So I was asked who would have broken that news to me. Um, and a lot of the time it was Cornette. A lot of times it was uh, Jimmy often got the responsibility of giving me what might be considered bad news because they knew that we went back. Sometimes it was JR, but at the time they were really, you know, they really believed in Mark Merrow. Yes. Mark had done an amazing job as Johnny B. Bad. In retrospect, I think we all <laughs> regret things we did especially given that the only reason I had to be uh, upset with Mark Merrow is that he walked in with a contract three or four days after I signed on the dotted line for nothing more than a guarantee. And I let that bother me, but I also let it fuel me, yes. as did Steve Austin. So it wasn't without it benefit. Worked out. It worked out for both of us. But I, I remember seeing Mark at a hotel, just you know, crossing paths and apologizing to him uh, and him accepting the apology. And that's what people do. They grow up, they realize their mistakes. He's, uh, what an amazing man he is for the talks he gives yes. and uh, you know lives he's helped and probably saved. One of the greatest ex-wrestlers of all time. Yes. And, uh, but uh, no, no doubt that uh, I was envious of the contract and the push but that it all worked out because it fueled not just me, but Stone Cold. We were like kind of co -patriot, compatriots in that we resented that, but also wanted exactly what he had. Talking about Punk and uh, Kenny Omega and Hangman and the Young Bucks and, boy, just everybody who was involved. Based on what you've heard, was any of that a fireball offense? By wrestling standards? Yes. <sighs> or has wrestling changed and now it's a corporate industry and you can't do that? Because I do wonder, we've seen a lot worse happen with seemingly yeah. a lot less. And also the, the, the chair throwing incident is exactly what uh, spurred on the Nurmagomedov. Did I say that name right? Talking about uh, <laughs> the... Khabib and oh, yeah, uh, Conor, yeah. McGregor. Conor McGregor, yeah. because you have something that is so it looks like a criminal offense being yes. used to push uh, a pay per view event, and uh, which could have been, probably should have been a fireable offense. I, I don't know. I mean, there's the boys will be boys thing. I don't know exactly when, when what went down. Yeah, we weren't there. But, That's uh, important uh, to say. But there was a bite mark on Kenny Omega and. <laughs> You know, I think Gerald Briscoe has the best takes on these on social media. He was hilarious. He's hilarious. What's this? The Milwaukee, Bu he just runs off like, yes. uh, and if you need a little uh, levity, go check out Gerald Briscoe. His Twitter's uh, phenomenal. His Twitter's tremendous, yeah. But I, I am curious because I think in, a, in an old school wrestling way, rather than guys getting suspended and perhaps fired, they turn it into an angle the next TV. And instead, everyone was stripped of their titles. There's a third-party investigation going on as we're recording this. And I've heard the rumor is it's a two-week suspension. I don't know that. Okay. And uh, Meltzer's speculating that he can't imagine, obviously Punk's had surgery, but he can't imagine Ace Steel coming back. And it just feels as if what fans tuned in to see most of all was all of this. As you said earlier, there's a lot of eyes on the product. There's a lot of interest. And we don't lean into it. We just no. don't acknowledge it at all. So, you know, my son, Dewey, who I acknowledged on Twitter, is I let him do his own thing. And especially when he was a writer, I tried not to knock the product too much. Um, but he's got some good takes on wrestling. And I said, what did you think, Dewey? He said, I think they could have taken advantage of all the new eyeballs yes. by weaving a storyline throughout the two, the two hours. So there was a lot of great wrestling on it. Uh, and, and, you know, and I did... I did voice my concern about the German suplex, and I know we've, you know, we're hearing feedback, both yes. positive and negative, and that's okay. But I wanted to put it out there. That's the way I felt about it. 
Uh, and I have no doubt those two guys, uh, uh, Wheeler and uh, uh, Garcia, are talented enough oh, yeah. to, to do great matches without that one move. Um, but I uh, I think they missed an opportunity to build yeah. some way. You could say you built uh, Garcia, uh, but I think they could have woven a storyline in there that could have helped somebody with all the extra eyeballs. Well, it's unfortunate because I think, you know, Maybe it's not just that wrestling has changed because I definitely framed it as that and said, you know, back in the old days of wrestling. But the reality is, if this is now a legal matter, um, you probably can't do that. And kind of made it, everything okay there. You got a hand pretty deep into the. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's a little chilly in here. We cranked down the AC because we got these lights going. Okay. My, okay. my hand's a little cold. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited you're here, but not that excited. <laughs> Uh, so Can I? I don't know if I use this line. Did I use this? Did I tell the story about Dennis Knight as Naked Minion? No. And one of the lines, um, I don't think it made the air. All right. I think it was Ixnade, even in the Attitude Era, which was where uh, I wanted uh, Naked Midian to be my assistant. Yes. Uh, when I was uh, commissioner. And uh, being not adept technically, I didn't have a cell phone legit. Right. I don't think I had a cell phone at the time. So I was going to use the pay phone. I was going to go, hey, do you happen to have a quarter? And he said, yeah, right here in my fanny pack. And I was going to reach back and say, I just need one, not a whole roll. And he was going to say, that's not my fanny pack. <laughs> and it didn't make the air. <laughs> that's phenomenal. <laughs> I love that. So what would you... Uh... What would you expect is next for CM Punk? Would you be surprised to see him back in AEW? Would you be surprised if they did part ways? Would you be surprised if he showed up in WWE one day? I, I you know, I just want him to be happy. You yeah. Understand what an amazing career he's had. I thought it was a little sad when he came out and basically in AEW and just cast off the last thirteen years and made it sound like anything that happened after ROH was a waste of time. Like this guy. He did some big stuff. He, he did some big stuff. And he was a great champion. He was kind of like the glue that held that company together. And he had great matches with a variety of opponents. I told him when he was a little down about not getting the main event slot, uh, I said, uh, Punk, I never called him Phil, you know, Punk. I said, just go out there and steal the show. The fans make up their mind right. who the main event is. Like, you know, and I used Edge and I as an example. It's arguable whether or not we stole the show. I don't know. I felt like we had a right to claim that we did. And we were not, by any means, the advertised main event. But you have to go back to the one, one of two wise things I ever said in my life, which is you don't let anyone else define for you what being a success is. Like, right. if you can't be happy tearing down the house with The Undertaker, then where are you going to be when you're 55 or 60 and looking back on your career? I just, I'd like him to be, I'd like him to appreciate what he did. It just, it, it goes back to wanting people to feel good. If you're just, I, I'll just give you an example. Uh, Tom Petty never talked highly of his Straight Into Dark, I think it was called Straight Into Darkness, the album from like the mid eighties. And I love that album. And every time he would dismiss it, it would make me feel a little bad for loving that album. And yes. it's like, but I got all these great, you know, there's been a change, one story telling a cover, you know, album, 12 quality cuts in a row. And now I'm being told by the guy who made it that it's not as good as I thought it was. So it reminds me when Phil tells, uh, Punk tells us that his run in WCW like it, it's not, it wasn't really him. It just, it takes you away mean WWE. From, WWE, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. D yeah d WWE. Uh, and the, you know, the, the moments he had with Cena, I remember him grabbing the title and taking off over the, oh, there were so many great moments. And, and to I, your point, I, yeah. Uh, you know, how many of those folks who were crying when he returned? Cause what a moment it was yeah. when he came back to AEW or to wrestling on that AEW program. It was a, a major moment. And was it a major moment because they really loved the stuff he did in Ring of Honor? No, no. it was a major moment because of the stuff he did in WWE. Right, so right. I don't think he really thinks that everything he did there was a waste, but I do think he was excited about having yeah. uh, the opportunity to return maybe to more wrestling, less sports entertainment, which I, I could understand. Yeah. But the result is everybody is talking about him in this circumstance and 
he's one of the hottest acts around and it would be interesting to see what's next for him. I think the the entire world is, is guessing if you were Hunter, would you want to speak to him if he was available or was that too unprofessional or what's, what's your take? I don't know what the legalities of that are, or he could come back as a heck of a heel and, um, I love that idea of him being a heel in AEW would be phenomenal because he's a great promo guy. Mm -hmm. He wears his heart on his sleeve. Yes. Uh, People can tell when he's, uh, you know, (laughs) having a meaningful conversation. And I think uh, he could work great programs. He's still at a, you know, he's still at an age where he can really go banged up. He was always banged up in WWE, always banged up, but uh, on a more limited basis, making a heck of a living for a pretty limited schedule. Can still got some gas in the tank and could probably, uh, you know, work some magic on that audience. I know that there's a, a lot of debate about, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze and was it unprofessional and, you know, should he be allowed back and all that? But I think to me, it boils down to that's a passionate dude. Uh, if he didn't care, we wouldn't have seen what we saw. Yeah. Uh, and that passion is something that you can't train. You can't, I mean, either you have it or you don't. And I think he cares a lot. And I think there's a whole lot of people who maybe misunderstand that. And I'm excited to see what's next for him. I'm a fan of him. We worked together at that Starcast three in Chicago. And that was kind of the first thing he did back in wrestling. Couldn't have been greater. Yeah. Super easy guy to do business with. The fans loved him. He was great with all the fans. I mean, it was uh, a five-star experience for fans and as the promoter of the event, he had a great time and I'm excited to see what he does next. And I just hate that the seemingly once harmonious look that it looked like was happening in AEW now feels I'm setting the table right now. Yeah. CM Punk managed by Frank, the clown. How about that? That's Chicago money right there. It's money, brother. Now a word from our sponsor, better help. I got to tell you, there's been a few times in my life where I felt like, uh, man, life was not going according to plan. Uh, I had a personal relationship that went sideways on me. Gosh, what was it now? 2006. And I don't know how to sort of pick up the pieces and move forward with that with a better mindset. Well, better help can help you if you're in a tough situation and it can be tough to sort of train your brain to stay in that problem solving mode, especially when you're faced with a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, man, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. That was certainly my experience back in 2006. And I challenge you to consider better help. If you're in a similar situation, I I was, uh, I was looking to figure out, Hey, what's next for my life. Everything seems to have changed and I'm not sure how to move forward. I needed to talk to somebody who wasn't in my immediate circle and to just sort of sort it out in my brain. If that makes sense, let me say this. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, better help is a great option. It's convenient. It's accessible. It's affordable. And it's entirely online. You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey, and you can even switch therapists at any time. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can help you get there. Visit betterhelp.com slash Foley today and get 10% off your first month. That's better H E L P dot com slash Foley. Betterhelp.com forward slash Foley. Well, let's talk about somebody else who was money. We're talking about uh, Brian Pillman today. Yeah. He's our subject. And uh, man, what a great influence he was on the professional wrestling business. And you even wrote in your book, I had known Pillman off and on since late 89, but had only recently become closer with him. A doctor had told Brian that if he didn't stop drinking, he'd be dead within a few years. And he took the advice to heart. In addition to changing his ways, he made a conscious effort to change some of his acquaintances. Brian began calling me regularly, offering me his Pillman pick of the week, (laughs) which was usually a saying or a bit of psychological (laughs) advice. I would then try to use his pick in an interview. When I left the company, WCW, I fell out of touch with him. And when I saw him again during a short stint in ECW, he seemed like a different person. Sadly, although we shared the same car on the night of his death, it seemed as if I hardly knew him when he passed and we're going to talk about your history with him, but man, what a story you told in your book there in just a few sentences yeah. about the evolution of y'all's relationship and how it changed and, and how maybe he changed. Um, and I find it interesting that we started the show almost just talking about the news and discussing CM Punk. And now here we are talking about Brian Pillman to totally 
polar opposite yeah. human beings, but certainly controversial in their own rights. Um, let's talk about, you know, the, uh, the first time you wrestled Brian, I had my first singles match with a talented young wrestler on the rise named flying Brian Pillman. This is from, uh, by the way, December 13th, mm-hmm. 1989, Raleigh, North Carolina. It's a TV taping. Uh, and it's going to be your first singles match in the WCW slash NWA. Uh, I went a full tilt eight minutes with Brian and we turned out a match that was excellent in quality and intensity. Terry Funk was doing the color commentary on the show. And if you listen closely, you can hear Funker's admiration (laughs) shining through. I had a tremendous match with him and his words of praise for me to the office helped my standing in the company immensely. Our ring chemistry continued over the years, but by no means were his matches with me a highlight of his career. Indeed, Brian Pillman was a constant show stealer with his series of singles matches with Japanese star Jushin Liger and his tag team exploits as one half of the Hollywood oh, yeah, blondes, man. along with a pre stone cold, Steve Austin, especially strong in my mind. So, so much great wrestling in his rear view mirror. And he's here, you know, tearing the show up with you. And it's your first time on TV here. You couldn't have had a better opponent. Probably. No, right? it was great. I was coming off that really nice run of losses. <laughs> where I would turn on my tag team partners. This is a, a Cornette and Sullivan creation because as Corny described me years later, like 20 years later, like they, he and Kevin had no say over who won, but nobody had thought to have any guidelines for the losers. And so they constructed this underneath angle where I start losing matches and turning on my tag team partners. They were usually the guys taking the fall. And it became something that the fans looked forward to. Right. uh, And responded to well. So my first real singles match, man, I'm so sorry about the burping, um, was against Pillman at the Dorton Arena. You know, they had to, I've looked at a lot of ceilings in my day, brother, and Dorton (laughs) Arena, one of the nicest. Underrated, the Jaffa Mosque in Altoona, PA. Beautiful, beautiful ceiling. Trust me. Been there. Looked Arn away. Anderson hated the Dorton Arena. Said it was hot. It was terrible. But I've always thought, having, having never been yeah. there, just seeing the pictures, what a beautiful building. It was a beautiful building. I'm getting a little confused because I thought it was at the Dorton Arena uh, where I dropped the elbow on nasty Ned Brady, where it very well could have been because I could have been doing double duty. Right. Because the match I had with Pillman was called by Chris Cruz and Terry Funk. So it wasn't for their flagship Saturday night show. It was a different show. And I remember at the end, Sting came out and he was just given directions. This kid, me and me, take some great bumps, bump them all over the place. And I did, you know. So I, I lose the match and then I bump all over the place and somehow come out of it with a, a stock that has risen because I've had a good solid eight minutes. Uh, you know, you could tell a little story and you could have good action in eight minutes and Funk was uh, putting me over. Uh, it was, you know, it was a good quality match, and it was just like an indicator of things to come. We would we never, we never really had the spotlight, you know, never really a feud, but we'd had some hot matches, including Brian coming off the uh, the uh, first level at Center Stage Theater, at Center Stage Theater with a crossbody, uh, flying crossbody. Like we did some really cool stuff and I really liked working with him. And he was light enough, like in that 210 area, somewhere around there. Uh, keep in mind that Brian had been a second team All-American as a nose guard. Yeah. Where the first team All-American, I was I believe was Refrigerator Perry. So now Brian comes, he goes to, you know, Calgary, he t- trains with the hearts and the dungeon and he's streamlined and, mm-hmm. you know, he doesn't look like a, uh, nose guard anymore, but he was a tough kid who'd overcome all those throat operations. Yes. Um, a partier, uh, had to change those ways. And I hate to say he had to change his, he, what he had to do is change his lifestyle. Yes. And so I did begin getting, uh, phone calls and it was always looked upon. They weren't long phone calls, but every 10 days to two weeks, you'd be like, Bellman's back of the week. I always sound more like John Laurinaitis than I do uh, well, Brian, but close enough. He goes, you know, don't be afraid to go out on a limb. That's where the fruit grows, you know. So uh, I like that, and I changed that to Cactus Jack. Say, don't forget to go out on a limb. That's where the carrots grow. 
So for the discerning listener, that like, well, carrots are actually in the ground. In the ground. Yeah. Uh, but I really, you know, I I liked Brian. I took a lot of pride in the fact that he stayed in touch with me when I left WCW. He would actually come to my Cincinnati area shows, like for Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Oh wow! We didn't wrestle in Cincinnati. We wrestled in Erlanger, Kentucky. And so, if those who don't know the geography, it's right across the river from Kentucky. And uh, we wrestled at Peel's Palace for uh, for Smoky Mountain. So one of my matches was a Falls Count Anywhere with Chris Candido, who I loved working with. Really enjoyed working with him. And I told Brian because he was there with Kip uh, Kip Young, the strength coach of the Bengals. Oh man, I we might have to about. do a little. Yeah, we'll uh, um, man, it's going to bother me. All right, we'll find out the name. But he was like another father to Brian. You're going to do a little googling here. Yeah, uh, strength coach, uh, Cincinnati Bengals, Brian Pillman. Uh, and I told Brian that because he had the strength coach that I was going to work a feat of strength <laughs> into my match with uh, Candido and the feat of strength I was talking about. Maybe you've seen this on a couple of WCW pay-per-views. I remember talking to Braun Strowman specifically saying, hey, I used to get a lot of mileage out of this and I didn't have the slightest hint or suggestion of muscle definition, but I would suplex objects right. onto opponents. Oh, sorry, but the spittle. Uh, and if that most of the time they'd roll out of the way, but we landed it just enough to where uh, it was, a uh, you know, it was uh, a factor. And in this case, Peel's Palace was a bar. And it was the oak, like, seating area that sat, like, 10 people. Kim Wood. Kim Wood. Kim Wood. Not Kip, not Kip Young. Kim Wood. Uh, and so it comes time for me to suplex it. But instead of suplexing a table, six to eight foot table, and I've got this 12 foot oak seating area. And I get it up to... <laughs> about here and for i battle with this thing in a way that i have not battled many opponents and it's not getting more than a foot off the ground i got basically sandwiched into my stomach and if it hadn't been for pillman being there with kim i would have let go and said this is more than i counted on especially because it's so long i'm endangering fans but I just, I don't want to say I muscled it as much as I finessed it. So keep in mind, I got it here. And when I finally got, now it's like a fulcrum, got it just enough where I get some momentum up. By the time it got about here, I'm in no control whatsoever over what happens with this uh, several hundred pound wooden object. And it made a heck of a noise. Nobody was hurt. Candido rolled out of the way, impressed both Pillman and Kim. And I never tried that again. <laughs> but it was really cool that a current WCW guy would come out to support a friend. Because it is sort of, um, I mean, you know, wrestlers get criticized for this. But you have a lot of, even civilians, you have work friends. Yeah. And then when they go take a job somewhere else, it doesn't mean that you guys are cross. You right. just don't see each other anymore because you were friends because you were at work. And, and so for him to come support you like this meant he wanted to be more than just your work friend. He yeah. wanted to be your friend friend. He was my buddy buddy. Yeah. And that's why, it, you know, when he was injured, devastating injury, he's never going to be the same worker. And, I mean, this was a, a great dark side of the ring two-hour episode. So I can't do justice to Brian's, you know, trials and tribulations the way they did on that episode. But uh, we're looking at the end of one of the great. He's essentially going to become another guy. Yes. Um, and now, but he had already the loose cannon had cut, had started making its mark before the injury. Yes. And he's doing groundbreaking stuff. Uh, I respect you, Booker Man, with Kevin Sullivan. Yeah, I want to get uh, in all that. Yeah, yeah, but okay. I do want to remind everybody at home because, well, unfortunately, we can't show you the match, but you can go watch this match, uh, the the very first singles match uh, with Brian Pillman and Cactus Jack here. It was on Worldwide. It aired on December 13th, 1989. Yeah. And hypothetically, the rumor and innuendo is if you just type in Brian Pillman versus Cactus Jack Worldwide, December 30th, 1989, you will find it on YouTube. Uh, so you can see that match there. And you got a series of other matches in the early 90s with him, including, check out this lineup, Brian Pillman and Bill Kazmaier against Cactus Jack and Abdul the Butcher. 
<laughs> you and Brian had your work cut out for you that night, did you not? Well, Abdullah was great. Abdullah was great to work with. Kaz Meyer, no, uh, He's not a nice a, guy. Nice guy. Uh, what was it like working with him? He was a nice guy. Yes. And the story there is, this is an Owen Hart original. He works with Dan Severn. And uh, Dan did not, Dan had been a, a, he had been a great amateur wrestler. Yes. Turned pro wrestler, turned UFC legend, who when he transitioned back to wrestling, couldn't get rid of the, you know, you're defending yourself. You're not opening yourself up, which is the counter, uh, you know, of what everything we do. Trust, <laughs> open yourself up. So Dan, I don't think ever recovered completely from you know, legit, MMA, yeah, MMA legit in a way that Shamrock did. Shamrock right, right. became a really good pro. Uh, so, and I was just on uh, the uh, Dan and uh, Don Don Fry's uh, podcast a few months ago. So there's no, it's not like there's any hard feelings. And I remember uh, asking Dan in uh, ninety uh, early ninety six when I had yet to uh, early ninety five or mid ninety five. We were rolling around. I feel like I need something. I feel like I need something. Like I need some kind of hold. And so this is here's Dan, who at that time was one of the most revered MMA guys, rolling around with Dan, trying to come up with something legit looking, so that I could start because I saw where the business was heading. Yes, or I could see that MMA was going to be big, and it got stalled for a few years, and you know, uh, legislation type of problems. Yes, uh, and it came back. Uh, and obviously it's just been a supernova, uh, but I could see that we were going to have to start incorporating a little bit of that into what we did. So all that being said, that's my pre build up to saying, love the guy, but, but bless his heart. But I, so I said to Owen, how'd the match go? He goes, uh, he's a nice guy. I said, how did the match go? And Owen turns to me, goes, he's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> his way of saying this is coming from a guy who took great pride in sticking up matches with Owen Hart as dude love but I don't think that was Dan's intention yeah uh, guys are familiar with a similar phrase she has a good personality <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not polite, but we're trying to be. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to be. Uh, Brian Pillman versus Cactus Jack is also uh, going to be a Saturday night match on November 30th, 1991. Both of those matches, the Bill Kazmaier Abdul the Butcher affair and this Saturday night affair, both on YouTube, including another interesting pairing that we saw in early 1992, Brian Pillman and Tom Zink against Cactus Jack and Abdul the Butcher. Yeah. Now that is Styles Clash right there. I mean, Brian Pillman and Tom Zink were two of the uh, the fan favorites amongst the ladies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, two handsome, good looking, yeah. athletic guys taking on two monsters. I mean, this is Beauty and the Beast. Uh, what do you remember about working against Tom Zink and Brian? Wow. Pillman? Well, first of all, I loved working with Abdullah. And I don't know if you know this story, but when I was a college freshman, I come to school. I'm armed with a couple of really bad jokes. Uh, my buddy would feed me the line like, uh, "What are you studying in you know college?" I, Stephen Wright was a great com comedian, and I just steal this. Like, uh, calcium anthropology, because everyone asks you what your major is. Yes, calcium anthropology, the study of milkmen. No wonder I didn't have any romantic success. You know, do you want to go hunting? I'm game. Boom. You know. Yes. This. And the other thing I had was a picture of Abdul the Butcher taped to my wall and the constant steady lie of claiming he was my dad. And you tell a lie big enough and long enough, it makes complete sense that this 360-pound black man is the father of, at that time, a 220-pound pale white man. <laughs> pale white man. But I told it so often, it made sense. So here we come. In 1990, I face off against Abdullah, you know, as an opponent. Uh, he came in to the rescue of Norman the Lunatic and Captain Mike Rotunda. Uh, so there's my lineage with the uh, uh, Rotunda family starts in 1990. But when we get we come in together, just to be a, a six, part of a succession of monster heels to battle Sting because it was thought that Sting had grown a little bit stagnant on yeah. top. 
just a quick injection, five, six week runs. I didn't know until, uh, you know, I, I didn't know right. that it was a five, six week run. And it, uh, you know, turned out to be a three year run, largely because Dusty saw something in me. Sting liked working with me. Uh, the, the style I had worked with just about everybody. Right. Uh, including the guys like Pillman and, and Zink. So part of the, beauty of working with Abdullah is you didn't call anything before the match because that's just not the way. If you called it, he was going to forget it. There was an aura of realism to the matches. And Abdullah was still, as far as territories go, one of the great drawing cards. No doubt. Because he could come in and set a territory on fire because he would supply what I think is missing in today's environment. That was the idea that your top baby face is not fighting for a win, he's fighting for his life. Yeah. And it didn't have to be your top. You could build a middle of the card guy, a middle of the top by putting him in the fight of his life with Abdullah the Butcher. And by the time Abdullah was gone, despite the fact that he rarely lost, he would have elevated a couple of stars along the way with some really bloody battles. So there wasn't a lot of blood in, in WCW at that time, but he still had that mystique. Oh yeah. And the two of us worked really well together. And I would just tell the opponent, you know, we, it doesn't make sense to call anything. It gets, that's just not the way it works with Abby. I might have one or two things worked out with somebody. And so we got in there with Tom Zink. I remember Abby specifically not going down for a super kick. And Z-Man, like he, okay, I get what he was doing. He's like, well, actually, he's making your second kick look better. Yes. Because he's not going, he's not every other guy. He's, you know, he's Abdullah the Butcher. And the fact that he's putting your kick over might take two or three times to do it. But, but that was part of the Japanese way. You know, you, you know, we treasured our finishes up until a number of years ago where you had to just throw 18, 20 false finishes into the mix to have a great match. But for a number of years, nobody kicked out of anybody's finish. Whereas in Japan, you might have to, even Stan Hansen might have to hit guys with a lariat six times to pick up the win. And then it made sense, strengthen the finish, strengthen the guy who lost to it clean. Uh, so in this case, Abdullah, it takes more than one kick to put Abdullah the Butcher down. But uh, you just, you're trying to pick up the pieces and make a work of art out of you know un, un, unknown unknown materials and more often than not it worked out well you might not have the cl the classic but you were going to get people engaged and it was going to seem different than anything else on the card ba -ba 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 blue chew proud sponsor here of foley is pod and so glad that we get to talk about blue chew by now you know as mick and i like to say it's a hot tag for your wiener guys. Confidence can take you far in life. It can also help in the bedroom, especially when it comes time to, uh, <clears throat> step up to the plate. That's where blue chew comes in. Blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost, you can take these dudes anytime day or night. So you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now the process is simple. You'll sign up at bluechew.com. You'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. It really is that simple. And the best part, it's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacies. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Foley at checkout. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is Foley and you'll receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring today's episode. I love uh, your analogy about uh, Abdul the butcher, because we've talked about that a few times that you really wanted to pattern your career after the guys like him and Bruiser Brody yeah. and the like, and that it's, you're not a bad guy. Who's here to win matches, right? You're here to hurt people. You're yeah. dangerous. And there is an air of danger and the suspension of, of disbelief is what we all look for. And as wrestling fans, yeah. and when we could be legitimately scared of someone, not like, Oh, I could beat that guy, but I don't want any part of that guy. That's a different thing. 
Do you think there's anybody like that in wrestling today at present in 2022? Man. Or is that a hole in the game where somebody could really make an impact if <sighs> they embrace you threw that? some names at me, I might be able to tell you whether. No, I don't think so. The idea that we both just immediately can't come up can't with one of somebody. means there's probably a yeah. spot for that. Or do you think that that could even work? Could that work now? Yeah. Now that everyone's a smart fan and everyone has social. Because like your monster can't also be tweeting. I don't right. want to see what he's eating for breakfast. Well, Bray, you know, Bray Wyatt. He uh, was close. He was close because his promos were so strong. I mean, there were people say he was booked poorly, but I think, man, you put a guy like that, you give him microphone time. And I know when he came back, uh, there, you know, when he, there was a, uh, uh, the, the, when he debuted as the Fiend, was that against Seth at Hell in a Cell? Uh, where he took everything and he kind of took it's including the silly sledgehammer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, might have been a li- little much, but I, I'll say that the fiend was kind of that monster. He's as close as we got. Yeah. In uh, but years. as far as guys just coming in, running roughshod, able to get over in a few, in a few weeks. Uh, and putting fear into the hearts of men, women, and children. Ch- nah, they, those days are. Do you think it's part of that is because, you know, times have changed just in our culture and society because guys like Bruiser Brody and Abdul the Butcher and the Sheik, they instilled fear because they just charged through the audience. Yeah. You know, they're, they're swinging that sword. They're, they're, they got a flaming branding iron. They're, you know, swinging that chain and they don't care who it hits. Like, Especially in Japan. Yes. So, I mean. Uh, Can't do that now. A Brody, to me, if, if people don't know a Bruiser Brody and they want to see what I think is the best entrance in wrestling history. No doubt. Has nothing to do with special effects or pyro. It has to do with Bruiser Brody coming out to the Led Zeppelin's Valhalla. And later on, he had to come out to like a generic version. It wasn't quite the same, but it was still Brody with a chain running through the crowd who were playing the willing role of extras in a, in a monster movie. Yeah. And if they didn't move, they'd get hit Yeah, and be happy for it. I'll never forget. First time I got to a Japanese uh, town. I mean, it was Tokyo, Cork and Hall. Uh, guy comes up. They got the white boards I like to have signed. Sashin Kudasai, which means uh, autograph, please, and dynamite kid from about here to here. Short. Bam. <laughs> Right in the cheek, mother goes like this, and I don't want to. I, I, I the, the, when he says "thank you," that's the way it sounded to me. Yes. Thank you. He was thanking Dynamite for, for punching, punching him in the face, and I thought to myself, "I'm not in Kansas anymore." And so I had the first night Cork and Hall, uh, um, we, you know, where I got a win. A rare win for me on the tour. And the next time I'm teaming up with Stan Hansen. And Stan was another great monster heel. I said to Stan, I understood we were going to be teaming up, you know. So uh, I said, Stan, I got some idea for spots. And he goes, I don't do spots, kid. I said, I know, but these are this day. He goes, I said, I don't do spots. I went, okay. So the next night we're teaming up. And uh, it was Stan and I went on to be good friends. And I put him over real strongly in my book, especially because of the way he talked about family yes. and calling my wife, said I wanted to try to have a family. Uh, but Stan had that, he had that cowbell, yes. that rope. And sure enough, man, he just came out, he swung that thing. And if people didn't get out of the way, he they got hit. And it was a, it was a different time. Lawsuits were not even on the, the page, especially in, in Japan. Um, you know, it was still a time when wrestlers regularly jumped into the crowd to take swings at yes. real swings. Uh, there were, I mean, there were a hand, you know, uh, Rotten Ron Starr was a guy who had a handful of lawsuits against him for beating up fans and, you know, breaking bottles over his head, not wanting to call matches. <laughs> I think I talked about this in Chicago a couple of years ago and Robert Fuller saying to me, uh, Jacko, don't think Ron Starr likes me. And I'm afraid he might take it out on you. I said, why is that, Rob? He goes, don't think he's gotten around forgiving me and Jimmy for breaking his neck. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, so we talked last week about the German. This is just a double black, back suplex. Yeah. Flat on the back, over-rotating a little bit. Boom, Ron Starr's on the shelf for months. 
comes back rugged, you know, real good old school worker, can work technically, can brawl, was the first guy to brawl with me all over the building. And I say to him, oh, Mr. Starr, my name's Cactus Jack. Is there anything you like to do in the ring? And he says, I'll see you in the ring. Yeah, anything you want to do, I'll see you in the ring. And I don't know what to expect until the moment I get in the ring with him. And then it's like, it was, uh, it was like punching a ticket to future stardom because I found something I love to do, which is utilize everything around the ring. He yes. Take me all around the building. And I got to do a lot of cool stuff without ever calling a thing. And it came across as being realistic because we were making it up as we went. Right. And so Ron was a real good, solid hand, but I wouldn't say that he was, you know, Brody or Abdullah, uh, another guy, Archie Goldie, the Mongolian stomper, used mm -hmm. to come in to a territory like Calgary that took great pride in its uh, wrestling acumen. Same thing with AWA. You know, it was a territory based in good, solid technical wrestling. So yes. that when somebody came in who did not do that, they stood out. And I'll just say, you know, I love the idea that every once in a while there's a guy who does not care about winning. Yes. I just like that. I disagree with Mr. McMahon who thinks you should be covering after every false finish because I think it takes away from the idea that you don't care. You enjoy Inflicting pain. Inflicting pain. Yeah. And I, I would call it like taking a second to admire your work. That to me is far more forceful than getting a one count. Yes. You know, I mean, you get in your head that it's a competition. Well, guy, you know, guys, you can watch other competitive sports on other channels. Let's take people away on a little, you know, trip for the senses that involves fear once in a while. So I, I'm curious because and I know we're getting a lot of sidebars here, but you mentioned about the Tom Zink super kick that he was that Abdullah by not going down after one was making the second one matter. And you sort of in passing mentioned, and this is years before it became the norm. Yeah. That you're, you're hitting all these finishes the first time. And I'm not saying this is the first time it happened. The first time I remember seeing that happen was rock and Austin. They would hit each other, have to hit each other with multiple stunners or multiple yeah. rock bottoms. But before that, you got hit with the tombstone. That's it. Yeah. Sort of thing. When do you remember that transition happening? Was it around the rock Austin stuff? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I also remember clear as a bell. This is going to like 2000. This is another 10 years where I, uh, I'm watching, uh, this is right before uh, Sting and I are going to have the, the match in TNA. Um, and I remember seeing, I was, I was, uh, watching on TV. I was on the road. So I was watching in Milwaukee and Undertaker and Sean are just tearing the house yes. down. And then I realized oh, what they're doing is they're kicking out of established finishes that time honored match winners. All I have to do. I just going to replicate the same formula with Sting. And then it dawns on me that I have not actually won a match in 10 years. Oh, wow. And there's entire generation of fans that have not actually seen me win a match with anything. And even the Manable Claw is a three second applause. You know, it's boom, three seconds of rabid applause before someone crotches me or something like that. Yes. That I essentially have no finishing move because I haven't won anything in so long. So in order for those false finishes to really mean something, they have to have been established yes. along the way. And it's hard to pick up wins with a variety of moves because we still use a time-honored finishing move yeah. that nobody kicks out of. And so it was a, it was a process. Um, let's talk about what you wrote about 1993 and WCW. I wasn't the only one getting the shaft at the time. Ooh. The Hollywood blondes, Steve Austin and oh, Brian yeah. Pillman were inexplicably broken up every once in a while. I hear someone talk about Austin and say he wasn't anything until he came to the WWF. The truth is Austin was always good. He was an excellent TV champ and he and Pillman were probably the hottest tag team I'd seen in years. They were funny and they knew how to wrestle as a team. And the matches they had with Steamboat and Douglas regularly stole the show in 1993. Um, you had a chance to work against them mm -hmm. as a pair. Uh, Cobo Hall, January 16th, um, 
Kobo Arena, sorry, in Detroit, uh, 1993. There's 2,300 fans there as <laughs> Sting, Dustin Rhodes, and Cactus Jack. What a pair yeah. that is. Take on Barry Windham, Steve Austin, and Brian Pillman yeah. in a street fight. And you actually pin Austin. I did? Uh, yeah. I don't Somebody know. had that on camcorder? What was your finish there? Uh, DDP's probably got it somewhere. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Uh, March 20th, 1993, Jacksonville, Florida. You're at the Coliseum. 3,000 fans are there to see you team up with Steamboat and Douglas uh, to take on Paul Orndorff and Austin and Pillman in an elimination <laughs> match. Uh, I'm curious. You know, you, you got a chance to see these guys up close. I think a lot of uh, quote unquote smart fans at the time thought they were the best tag team in the yeah. world. And they really weren't like a lot of tag teams that had come before them. It was different. It wasn't exactly Arn and Tully. It wasn't yeah. exactly the rock and roll express or the midnights or demolition or the road warriors. It was something totally new, a, a totally new style where both guys could cut a promo. Both guys could talk. Uh, but they also tried to inject some humor. They were doing parodies and things yeah. years before that was commonplace. Yeah. Uh, not to take anything away from Edge and Christian, but kind of Edge and Christian before they were Edge mm -hmm. and Christian. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like to be in the ring with them? And, you know, just take us back to your memories of working those matches. It's actually more of an observer that I remember uh, that tag team because. I don't want to say this for a fact, but my recollection is that they would almost always close the show, whether or not they were billed as the main event, because they were going to be really tough to follow. I, I was just in uh, Nashville this past, last weekend with uh, Steamboat was there and Shane was there. And I'm not knocking Shane because he had such a great run. He had a couple of great runs, but yeah. one of was the franchise, Shane Douglas. He wasn't doing the business that I think his career should have afforded him. Yes. Especially when you look back. I know the stuff he did as the franchise was tremendous, but he was state of the art. This is tough about him teaming up with Steamboat and anybody trying to, you know, take the place of Jay Youngblood, you know, that legendary team, Steamboat and Youngblood. And for anyone to go in there on a nightly basis and not be considered like uh, the weak link of that team, yes, it's really important. And yes. those guys, I mean, they were tearing it down. And I was a guy, I took a lot of pride in the good matches I had. I couldn't follow those guys, you know, they were so good and they had the 20, 25 minute, 30 minute, closing and we were working in front of some small crowds but the idea was you're going to try to get those 2300 people to go and talk before the age of social media it was really grassroots yes to, and sometimes you'd be disappointed to come back to that same venue and have less people right but there was that old frame of mind like i'm not going to do much out there tonight and i think maybe you should save that attitude for the people out in the street who did not choose to attend but don't take it out of the people who paid their money. You'd want to go on there, out there, and give them the best match you possibly could, whether it was twenty five thousand or, or twenty five hundred, or even you know the longest I ever went was fifty four minutes, and that was in front of twenty six people in Jonesboro, Arkansas. So I took it as a personal insult that uh, you know they raised the prices, and they didn't get the return. You know they went from having fifty people to twenty six because Foley came into town. Cut the uh, and I was personally offended by that. Like in '93, and they go out there and do whatever you want. I said, I'm gonna do have the best match I can. And there, by the, today's standards, there was probably a lot of walking and talking and rest holes, but by God, it was still 54 minutes in front of 26 people, and uh, we had them, brother, in the palm of our hand. Okay, guys, got some big news for you a day one sponsor for us here on the program, Chili Sleep is now known as sleep me. That's right. Sleep me is the new home for chili sleep. They're still bringing you the same great sleep that chili sleep offered, but under a new name, sleep me makes the coldest and most comfortable sleep systems available. They create the environment that meets the body's natural need for lower core temperatures, promoting deeper restorative sleep. Chili sleep makes the Uller. That's what I've got the cube. And now the doc pro sleep systems. 
Here's the deal. They're water-based temperature controlled mattress toppers that fit over your existing mattress to provide you your ideal sleep temperature. These mattress pads keep your bed at the perfect temperature for deep cold sleep. These sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. And I want to mention they launched that brand new Doc Pro sleep system. It has two times, two times more cold power than the other models. It's also whisper quiet. And it has a tubeless mattress pad design that allows for five times more cooling contact. Pair it with the new sleep.me app for enhanced device control and sleep scheduling. Head on over right now, sleep.me forward slash Foley to learn more and save 25% off the purchase of any new Doc Pro, Cube, or Uller sleep system. Now, this offer is available exclusively for Mick Foley listeners and only for a limited time. That's sleep, S L E E P dot M E slash Foley to take advantage of our exclusive discounts and wake up feeling refreshed every day. Seriously, y'all, it costs nothing to look as our old pal, Jim Ross says, go take a look sleep dot me forward slash Foley. You're going to feel better. You're going to get a great night's sleep. And can you even imagine waking up and not feeling tired? I'm doing it. Thanks to sleep dot me forward slash Foley. You would write Brian Pillman was in my opinion, an accident waiting to happen. Always a tremendous athlete and exceptional wrestler. Brian's popularity had peaked when he began his loose cannon persona in 1996 in which he managed to not only convince the fans, but most of the boys in WCW as well, that he was legitimately out of control. Mm -hmm. I saw him during this time. And despite our having been good friends prior to the birth of this character, I had little to say to him. He either had a screw loose for real or was doing a convincing job of pretending to. This character had made Brian a hot commodity right at the time when his contract was ending, but a near fatal auto accident also put his future as a wrestler in jeopardy. Brian did return to wrestling, but he was never the same. His ankle especially was badly injured and he took a great deal of medicine to mask the pain. Yeah. He signed with the WWF, but a variation of his loose cannon personality never really took off. His behavior was erratic and his ring work was at times embarrassing. And to hear you mm. or read you your words there, considering the way you felt about him before, it does feel like you're talking about two different people. Man, I just surprised I said embarrassing. Um, but that would be more based on physical ailments. No substance substances. I think yes. there were a few times where you know the soma shuffle. It was, it was tough because these are prescribed medications. At the time, there was not a national data database. So guys could go from town to town with different doctors and get prescriptions. I don't think you can do that anymore. And I know uh, WB's got the drug testing and like it's frowned upon. I went back out on the road and maybe, two, you know, and when I say back out, I was always on the road doing different things. But I was surprised, I'd say in like 2000, Six two thousand seven. When I saw a couple of the guys, uh, Buff Buff really struggled for a long time. I think he's back in rehab. But that was a rude awakening to me to see that that was still something the guys were doing. But I think Brian, you know, in trying to mask the pain, over medicated, and sometimes it affected his performance. When I said I didn't have much to say to him, it was that it was awkward. It wasn't like, hey, I I'm, I don't like you. What I remember, and I don't think I voiced it in here, is that it hurt my feelings that I wasn't a guy he could say, hey, wink, 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 nod, we're okay. I guess in trying to have as much commitment as possible, that character, he thought he needed to work everybody. And I remember that was the night he said he was going to take a whiz in the ring, and he started calling the ECW fans smart marks, and he actually got them angry. Like, you didn't think you could. Cyber Slam 96 right. is what you're talking about. And so that was, uh, and he came out with that cane, and yeah. he made himself one of the hottest prospects in the entire business. And uh, WWE was determined to have him, whether it was at his best or not. And, uh, you know, he came in, he was an announcer, he did the angle with the uh, gold dust. And Before we bounce around there, I do want to ask, what did you think? You know, when you saw all the stuff go down in WCW, you're not there at the time. Right. Uh, but it became the talk of the industry. Right. And people were talking about, you know, 
this loose cannon persona and, and there was, they were trying to build towards the uncensored pay-per-view and it was essentially Hulk Hogan and Macho Man against every freaking heel in the building. And for whatever reason, Pillman was unavailable that night, uh, even though he was booked. And then as you referenced earlier, he did have the circumstance on a clash of the champions with, um, Kevin Sullivan and it's supposed to be a respect match and it's a strap match. And instead he grabs the mic. I respect you Booker man, acknowledging that Kevin Sullivan is one of the writers of WCW and, and quote unquote bookers. And then he jumps out of the ring and grabs the jacket off of Bobby, the brain Heenan, who had Bobby had a, the next surgery and he was hot about it. Right. And said the F word on the air. Yeah. Um, what the F are you doing? And Bobby was embarrassed and humiliated and it sort of went against code, if you will, to do something like that. But that was what he was going for. And then depending on who you believe, cause Lord, we've beat this up forever on my podcast. Uh, Eric Bischoff fires him supposedly wink, wink. It's just to work the boys and create a story and get people talking and create some buzz. But Pillman would then use that to his advantage to get himself booked in ECW and then negotiate showing an actual release from WCW with the WWF. Mm-hmm. We were reading about this in the newsletters. Mm-hmm. You're working in the industry. This is a guy that you used to be pretty good friends with. Mm-hmm. And now you see all of this happening. What was your take on all of that pre ECW stuff? Just the WCW. Wait a minute. He's fired, but he's not really. I mean, this was all written about in a phenomenal book that Kim Wood participated in, um, Crazy Like a Fox. Okay. What did you think of We're Working the Boys? All it, of it hadn't been overdone at that point. Yes. So it was really uh, revolutionary. And if Brian had not been injured in that Humvee accident, we'd be regarding him as one of the biggest stars of all time i get right? the vibe you didn't like it though you said a minute ago it hurt your feelings i didn't like on a personal level i just thought i could you know what i'm i'm not going to tell anybody but i guess when you're brian you're going to have to uh do the dta don't trust anybody with this uh i thought i should have been one of those guys given I that i had been his friend but i won't deny that it was working yes it was it's just on a personal level it's like you take a guy that you, you know, did some riding with, that you were, you know, came to your shows, you considered a good friend, and now you don't know what to say to him because you don't even know if you know him at all. You believe he's working, uh, and if he is, it's a credit to him, but you kind of wish you'd just been let in on the, uh, uh, you, you know, let in on the, the character a little bit. But I, I if, if he could have made, you know, the Pillman thing was the high level of work. So when Jushin Liger comes over, you you know it makes perfect sense for him to be in the ring with uh, Pillman. Yes, because they're going to tear it down. You understood that Brian could work, uh, you know, with just about anybody, and have a good match, a uh, good to great match. And he was like a, a Flair protege. Yes, you know, I mean, Flair took him under his wing. There were angles where he'd be the guy to save Ric Flair. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a controversial bad, you know, where. Did Funk put, uh, I mean, they weren't allowed to get blood, so they'd go about trying to get heat, especially with with Funk, plastic bag over Flair's head, you yes. know, and the plumbing comes in, makes the save. Like, clearly he was, you know, earmarked for I don't greatness. know that he made the save in there, but your point is correct. Yeah. He did do an angle to sort of join the horsemen and yeah, all that yeah. jazz. And um, Flair definitely believed in him. And, and all of the WCW brass did. I mean, he had really high profile matches at super brawl, as you pointed out with Jushin Liger, and then a great series of, of matches with the horsemen and, and, and with Arn Anderson and Ric Flair and all those guys, not to mention the squeegee altercation with psycho Sid. that got him a lot of respect amongst the boys. <laughs> did it not? <laughs> it did, yeah. w- what do you remember hearing of that? I was, ah, man, I didn't go out a lot, but in Atlanta, the Ramada had a hopping club, and I did stay. They had a rate for the the boys. We spent a lot of our time, in, in, more time in Atlanta than any other city. I didn't have a place. I stayed with my mom and dad. You know, I'd been out of the house for several years, but I was only home four or five days a month. Like, you know, we they rode us pretty hard. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, remind me what we're talking about. We're talking about the squeegee incident. Uh, squeegee. So, it's at the Ramada, and 
I, Sid, I think it was Sid came back after the incident and I was there or he had just taken off. So I hear about it, which is Sid comes back. He's not in WCW. I don't think he's in. I think he's gone to WWE. And Sid, you know, notoriously with Arn, you know, I mean, that's the, the a really sad point in our business, I believe. I don't want to put, but Sid may have been, uh, a tr you know, uh, pointing out his success in a way that didn't sit right with uh with the boys yes so i believe pillman who was really sharp with his tongue as was arn so arn i don't know the inside but i arn probably made said look bad in front of the guys verbally cut him down and if you're you know you don't go you don't do verbal battle with arn anderson unless you've got a good sense of humor if you don't don't engage with him he's going to get the best of you and in this case i think pillman similarly puts it in his place and then Sid went out to his car where his weapon of choice was a squeegee. <laughs> I don't know if it was used. I just remember when I showed up in uh, Greensboro, there were about 300 fans, you know, newsletter reading fans who had made cardboard squeegees. And me and Sting and I incorporated that into our cage match that night, which was an excellent cage match, especially by my standards. But Pillman was seen as the guy who stood up to Sid and forced him to engage in a squeegee, you know, the, the squeegee incident. So, yeah, he, he had a lot of respect among the guys. People knew how hard he'd had to battle his whole, you know, his whole life. He was an underdog who wasn't supposed to make it. He was undersized uh, for college football, went on to be a second-team All-American, went on to play with the Bengals. Yeah. And when he showed up to wrestle... He, he goes through the dungeon. He works Calgary, which is this thankless territory where it's freezing cold with long rides. And he does that and becomes a star. And uh, yeah, it was was uh, the sky seemed to be the limit for him in WCW. So then he does go to ECW and he does these sort of crazy skits. Um, there's a, a circumstance where he's wrestling a pencil. <laughs> um, and he winds up getting a deal with the WWF and he signs a deal when he's got the shattered ankle. Yeah. And this is the same year where you're coming in. And it's interesting to think about the talent that moved back and forth in 1996. We would see Sean Waltman, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, those types go to WCW, but right. we would see Brian Pillman. Nick Foley. When did Brian come into W? When did Brian come into WWE? Nine, Ninety-six. But he was too injured. He was several months where he was just announcing, right? Yes. Okay. So he he came in in the summer of ninety-six, uh, just shortly after you were there. Uh, and of course, we know Marrow's there too. Uh, Austin came, I believe, at the tail end of the year before. Yeah. But quite a little talent swap. But they hold a big press conference. He comes in to a bunch of hype. Uh, it's not the way that Vince normally brought guys in. But he knew that he couldn't debut him in the ring right away, so he wanted to show off his new signee with his press conference, and he started to do commentary on superstars. And unfortunately, he tried to rush it back and had to have the ankle operated on again. So they did the whole angle with him and, and Steve Austin where they crushed his yeah, foot yeah. on superstars. And then that led to a pretty controversial moment in WWE history where – as far as I know, never on television had there ever been a gun in professional wrestling before, right. certainly not in WWE. And this didn't happen in the confines of a squared circle or the arena, but still seeing a gun on WWF TV was a pretty bold move to make in 1996. You're not talking about Billy or the ass boys, right? We're talking about. No. Scissor me, daddy. A scissor me. Uh, what did you think of the, the home invasion concept <laughs> and a gun? I mean, listen, we just talked a few minutes ago about the air of danger and how it was missing in yeah. wrestling. But a lot of people felt, well, this is different. <laughs> what say you? God. Hey, it was captivating. No doubt about it. Uh, Brian holed up in his home with a pistol, uh, Melanie by his side. 
Uh, I think there was a lot of negative feedback. Yes. Because it crossed the line. Uh, and this is like this. Um, s- shootings were not really a thing yet. You know, the mass shootings. Right. S- because I remember when Columbine went down and that was, uh, I, I remember we were talking to, the mom of uh, who had lost uh, one of her, Ann Kector was her name, and I kept in touch with her for many years. She told me that her last memory of her son, Adam, was he was rolling around with the dog watching Monday Night Raw. So that was, whether it was Raw, it was definitely, and that was, she was so happy she had that last memory. But I'm just bringing up the point that it wasn't the same hot button issue because of the school shootings because that's October 96, the, right. the invasion angle and Columbine was April 20th, 1999. Okay. So, so two and a half years later. So we're, we weren't getting the heat because of that. It was just whether or not that was appropriate for a wrestling show. Right. Um, what did you know. think though? Did you think it was too far at the time? You don't know where the line is until you've crossed it. Right. And I think, yeah, I think they did cross it a little bit. You know, it should be a guy should be able to break into a coworker's house without fear of being gunned down, right? Edge breaks into the Cena house. <laughs> down goes it's true. Cena. By the way, I have to highly recommend Brian Gewurz's book. Phenomenal. It's really good. And I lost track of the number of times I laughed out loud. And I know the funny thing is, I know Cena Sr. probably better than I know John. Right, I know his dad better because we've been on so He's many. He's quite indies. the showman. Quite the showman, but on that, <laughs> Brian was talking about just how bad Cena Senior was, where he was calling to lead a chicky poo, you know, like so they had to really do a number on the editing, and once they did the number on the editing, I thought it was a great piece to have Edge. Sometimes your hand was forced based on what you had. I thought it turned into a great segment. Down goes Cena. Down goes Cena. In what was essentially a home invasion of sorts. Yes. You know, so I believe we should have the comfort in wrestling of knowing we can invade a co-worker's house. We just hope the, they don't have a gun. Yeah. He beat up his dad. Like, that shouldn't be off the table just because somebody's a proud gun owner. Today's episode is brought to you by Car Shield, who makes it easy and affordable to protect my car from expensive repairs. And that's just for starters. Car Shield is the number one auto protection company in the U.S. and offers protection plans for around a hundred bucks a month. The plans cover more parts than ever before. Whether your car has 5,000 miles or 150,000 miles, and let me tell you how simple it is to get your car fixed. When you need a repair, you choose the mechanic, and Car Shield's administrators handle the rest. That's it. You don't have to deal with the paperwork or headaches you're taking care of. Same goes if your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road. Plans through CarShield also include coast-to-coast roadside assistance. CarShield administrators are there for you with rental car options and trip reimbursement at no extra cost, too. Get coverage today, and you'll lock in your price now, and it will never go up. That means as long as you own your car, no matter how old it is, you're protected from the rising cost of parts and repairs for your vehicle. CarShield helps protect my wallet from expensive car repairs, and they'll do the same for you. Go to carshield.com slash podcast to start your plan and lock in your pricing forever. That's carshield.com slash podcast. A deductible may apply. Let's talk about your interactions with him in the WWF here. You had two matches with him on raw in June of 97. We briefly talked about these on our dude love episode, uh, Hartford on June 9th. Uh, you're the replacement to face Pillman because Austin was hurt. And, uh, this of course is the show where Sean had his backstage fight with Brett. Yeah. Um, and this is where Corny comes to me, tells me my ship has just come in. Yes. Uh, Meltzer would say this. Michaels was scheduled to wrestle Brian Pillman in the TV main event, doing the run in after the Hart Foundation were all scheduled to jump Austin as he was coming down the aisle for the match. Austin versus Pillman, the match had been hyped all week, was canceled because Austin injured his right knee, which was the good one, by the way, landing on it wrong, coming off the top rope during a spot in the previous night's match with Michaels at King of the Ring. Mankind then made the replacement for Austin and Pillman's first major TV match, but the match totally fell flat because there wasn't much to it. It was a major letdown after all the hype of Austin versus Pillman, 
both on TV all week and throughout the live TV show, airing clips of the ankle breaking angle, including the breaking into Pillman's house angle, and even Austin sticking Pillman's head in the toilet bowl the previous night. <laughs> in addition, mankind isn't over as a baby face at this point, the way everyone expected he what? would be. And Pillman is limited in what he can do in the ring and his ankle was still in tremendous pain. So you guys go seven and a half minutes. It's a, it's a DQ deal. Where would it? So what date is this? Uh, this is June 9th, 1997. Uh, I'm going to argue that after the JR interviews, mankind was over as a baby face. So I'm going to differ. I don't know if the match felt, it probably did because I can't remember a thing about it. Yeah. But I, I will argue on behalf of mankind that, yeah, he was doing really well. Uh, man, am I glad I canceled my subscription during my tenure with WWE. No kidding. That would have been a downer to come off the road every week and hear how I disappointed people. Well, you made up for it. June 30th in Des Moines, you're on Raw, and uh, Pillman would beat you by count out in nine mm -hmm. minutes and four seconds. You get the, uh, the praise, fairly good match. Way better than their match a few weeks back, <laughs> ending when Mankind was chasing Helmsley and China to the back. Uh, you would also work um, in front of 4,200 fans, a New Haven uh, house show uh, where it's Undertaker, Goldust, and Dude Love uh, <laughs> taking on Bret Hart, Brian Pillman, and the European champ, Davey Boy. Uh, any memories of any of these matches in this era in the WWF? No, it's more a, a general recollection of how hot the uh the u.s canada, US thing, canada was. thing was and look we uh brian was not the performer he used to be but he was a real valuable part of that that feud um because i think you saw a part of brian that wasn't <sighs> look the loose cannon seemed it was really good and really believable because so many people had grown up watching brian, yes. brian pillman so you saw the evolution of this character in a way you did not see when he just showed up in WWE and he's a loose cannon. And it seemed a little for, you know, he, he's got to be the radical guy on the microphone. And I, and I just, you know, there's that old school part of me that feels like the announcer's supposed to put over the talent. And it was supposed to be a show. And I understand WWE just signed this big contract. Uh, you've got to you've got to uh, put a spotlight on the guy, but it wasn't didn't seem like a natural fit. Brian on commentary, you know, it's not something everybody takes to. And Brian had he had the added emphasis where he's got to get his personality across in a way that can take away from the matches a little bit. I just remember it feeling inauthentic as compared to the WCW and the ECW stuff that I'd done like it, it just, it seemed a little, it just, it didn't, it didn't, didn't not resonate the way that it had in WCW. But yet when he was part of the heart foundation and toned it back, that did resonate. I thought that that worked really well. That was probably the high water mark for Brian as far as being a character in WWE was being part of that group of people. As we mentioned last week, uh, Pillman's going to defeat Goldust at ground zero. He's going to win Marlena for 30 days. Yep. Uh, we talked about the intercontinental title tournament that would air on S September 15th. It was supposed to happen on the Nove uh, September 9th raw. But they said Pillman wasn't there, and instead they played the Triple X Files video of him with Marlena. <laughs> anyway, the match finally happens. It was taped on the 9th in Muncie, uh, but it airs on the 15th. And here's what Meltzer had to say. Pillman beat Dude Love by DQ when Goldust attacked Pillman. Marlena was in Pillman's corner with a new hairstyle, a nose ring, and dressed all in black, acting as if she was miserable. She was cheering on Goldust when he attacked Pillman. Uh, and you're kind of in the middle of all this, and allegedly... There was some uh, history there with Dustin and and the way he felt about Marlena having, I guess, a previous relationship when she was in WCW as maybe a makeup artist or a, uh, a valet, Alexandra York, with Brian Pillman. Did you know that there was maybe some hurt feelings or uneasiness? I, I did not. Uh, I remember, uh, Terry taking Brian's death really hard. And that was my first indication. Maybe, you know, I mean, they were young and single at the time, both of them young and yeah. single dust, you know, Dustin hadn't started his relationship and you have attractive people around each other and you know, things, things happen. Things happen. 
Uh, you can't undo that clock. Um, did I fall flat yet again as dude love? No. Uh, September 22nd, uh, during the Owen Pillman intercontinental title match, the commentary team would announce that Goldust and Marlena are going to re- uh, renew their wedding vows on the October 6th raw from Kansas city. Uh, but before we get there, we see Goldust pin the Sultan with iron Sheik with a bulldog. But during the bout, Dude Love, who's doing commentary for the match, says if he wins his match against Brian Pillman at Bad Blood, then Pillman would face Goldust in a no DQ match immediately after. So as a little footnote here, um, you're involved in this. Uh, His last match, unfortunately, happened on October 4th, 1997 in St. Paul, Minnesota. There's 5,683 fans there to see Goldust pin Brian Pillman. And after the match, Pillman hits Goldust with a crutch, Drags Marlena backstage and as for the scheduled Brian Pillman dude love match at bad blood in St. Louis. Didn't happen. Dustin's going to be handcuffed to the ring post. So he couldn't interfere. The plans were supposedly that dude love would win. And then Pillman versus Goldust and the no DQ match would take place immediately afterwards. As we know that match did not happen. And they replaced these matches with a Mexican minis tag and a DOAs versus Bariqua's eight man tag. And supposedly the wedding segment on raw would have had Pillman interrupt and Marlena would leave Goldust to go with Brian in the storyline. Of course, we never saw any of that, uh, because unfortunately Brian passed away and was just 35 years old. Here's what you had to say. I was scheduled to wrestle him the following day in St. Louis on the bad blood pay-per-view. And to be quite honest, I had great apprehension about Mm -hmm. the match because his condition had been so poor and his ring work had sunk so far from its previous levels. But Brian never made it to that show. He was found dead in the same Super 8 motel that I'd slept in that night. An enlarged heart was detected, and it was ruled as the official cause. Some have claimed the WWF should have checked for such a defect. Actually, they did. As did the NFL, as did the Canadian Football League, as did World Championship Wrestling. The defect never showed up. Vince called a meeting of all the guys to address Brian's death, but informed us that maybe time had passed him by and that some of the old formulas that had been successful for so long were simply outdated. He was a big enough man to shift responsibility to the wrestlers for much of their character development. And that really was meeting that way. That was really the meeting. That was really the meeting that did away with the ridiculous gimmicks and ushered in a new era of realistic human beings that people could actually relate to. This was more or less the birth of the Federation's, attitude yeah. campaign. And we'll talk about that yeah. a little more, but you know, I want to talk about when you knew the news, how you found out. I mean, this is a guy who you had a history with. Maybe you had grown apart. Uh, you know, we talked earlier about maybe work friends and maybe this was a buddy, buddy situation. It's starting to feel maybe more like work acquaintances here at this point. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. I mean, we were good enough friends that he was riding with me the night before. Um, I was really concerned because it was still a project to have, it's one thing to have a flat, you know, a flat match or just a completely character driven match on TV or the house show, but you have to be good at a pay-per-view, right? Yeah. It has to be pretty good. And so I was concerned. Especially in your house. Yeah. I, I, I was not yet Mr. I, well, I think you I were. can make a claim. You, you mean 90, Sean Yeah, Michaels buried alive. So, yeah, I think I was Mr. In Your House, and I, I was feeling some. No, well, let's not no. uh, Let's not go there right now. But I, I did have a – I was apprehensive. I did not know how we were going to make this anything better than okay. I think I would have settled for okay. I was nervous about it. And uh, Jim Cornette comes in, and he says – Pillman's dead in a way that made me think like he's in big trouble. Right. Something he's messed up somehow. He's Pillman's dead. And then whether it was Jim, Jimmy did let us know he was not, you know, he was not speaking figuratively, you know, literally Brian had passed away. And I remember calling my, my wife and I was in tears. It really was broken down. Uh, it was a, the fact that Undertaker and Sean went out there and had that match for the ages, some testament to those guys. I was really relieved that I wasn't, you know, put into a match that night is, you know, it was, it was just devastating because you seen Brian, you know, when, when he had that meeting with the doctor 
about the longevity of his life and he made that change, conscious change. And I felt like I was part of that and that he was not just the work friend, but that he would come to see me and we shared phone calls and I may have been part of his recuperation. That made me feel really good. And you see a guy excel in a way that's organic, uh, you know, and he surpasses any ceiling that his character supposedly had. Uh, The last several months had, they'd been sad. Uh, they, they, they'd been sad. So, uh, I mean, match quality is the least of our concerns now that we look at the big picture. But here's a human being who was in the car with me the night, be- you know, hours before his death. We were at the Super 8, so I guess, you know, I was still thrifty, s- saving those dollars. Uh, he did not ride with me to the arena the next day. Um and when that news came in, it was it was really devastating. It Had really, you planned to ride with him? I, I don't know. Yeah. I believe it was my car. But it was one of the things where he needed, hey, give me a ride. Sure. But we weren't riding the loop together. I got you. So, uh, I so mean, maybe it was a one-off. It I can't a- tell you. That I don't believe I called the room. Um, but we were in many. I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. I believe in Meltzer's report, um, it came out that, you know, there were beer bottles in his room, okay, which wasn't necessarily yeah. uncommon. I mean, we used to hear after the matches, a lot of the guys would sure, yeah. get a case of beer and drink it on the way to the next town. Right. And, you know, whoever was in the back seat was dispersing the beers or what have you. And yeah. it was just a part of the business. And you weren't necessarily a big drinker, but that wasn't something that would have been alarming to you. No, right? no, not at all. Um, but allegedly, and again, I'm saying this to someone who, has never taken a summer and wouldn't even know what one looks like. The trouble, as I understand it, is when you mix summers mix with alcohol, boy, it becomes a dangerous proposition. And I'm not saying that he overdosed. I'm not saying that. Yeah. I, I am just saying that it seems like a lot of the guys who had trouble with somas is from a combination of mixing the two. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever take a soma? I took two somas in my life. Uh, and in both times I was incapacitated to the point where I, you know, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even walk across the street to watch uh, WWE with a, a neighbor. My kids went over there one night. And then one night I was supposed to drive my son to his uh, uh, church league basketball game. And I just told my wife, I don't feel like I can do that. You know, I mean, just, and um, I mean, it was just a, it was like a three pill sample packet when my wife's mom passed away, you know? And it's like, she weighed 110 pounds. I was you know, almost three times that. And this was knocking me out pretty much. So I understood the, you know, the power in these. And I understand you need it sometimes medically. And I think that most of the guys get, take them out of medical necessity and then find out it makes them feel good. And that's yes. a whole other issue. Um, but yeah, I only had those two singular Soma experiences. So I can't even wrap my head around the fact that somebody would take six before a match and say, I've got 20 minutes before these kick in, you know, that's just, that. Uh, and you've heard of guys doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I heard of guys taking up the, well, whether it's pain medication or Soma's, you know, an ungodly amount of things per day, just incredible. Every once in a while. You know, I've got some deb- you know, I got some pretty serious pain issues. Yeah. Uh and every once in a while, five milligrams. You know, my problem with pain medication is I have to get a new prescription every year because they run out after eighteen months or whatever. Yeah. And I'll say, Do you think I've got eighteen left out of thirty? So I might take twelve pills a year, you know, which I don't believe is a problem. No. <laughs> I don't think bliss. When guys are doing that, like before you know taking half the day before yeah it's yeah. crazy um but man i i i knew uh, i could just see if i could foresee you know a terrible end like i knew where i did not want to end up and i just for me i kept extending my definition of a severe pain so when i and i know we're getting off track and i'm making this about me but we'd talked in a previous episode about uh you know the pain I was in before I had my hip replaced in 2017 
And I would come in off the road and my wife would just say, please take something. You're miserable. Yes. You're miserable. And I'd be sitting there and I'd be like, well, you know, I'd call it, do you think you could pick that up, a pint of Ben and Jerry's? Like that was, you could argue that's more dangerous than the stuff, you know, as far as the weight gain and all yeah. that and battle I've had with my weight my whole life. Um, but that was my way of dealing with it. Even when I was picking up weight, uh, you know, in my run, it was like, man, I'm really hurting. There's a billboard every exit, and by God, there's worse things I could be doing than stopping at this Perkins. Yeah. Uh, but when you're doing it on a nightly basis and you're self-medicating with <laughs> pumpkin pie and late-night meals, that can affect you too. Yeah. And it probably cut my career short by a couple of years. Uh, and again, not to detract from what Brian was going through, but that would be an answer to the Soma question. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! The five star reviews are in and it's confirmed. SaveWithConrad.com can save you thousands. Jimmy E writes that we saved his family more than $1,000 a month. James S says we saved his family more than $1,200 a month. But how much can you save? It's free to find out right now at SaveWithConrad.com. But if you've got a second mortgage, if you've got credit card debt, or even worse, if you're in a 30 year loan, it's not a matter of if we can save you money, but a matter of how much at SaveWithConrad.com. Woo Wings, a virtual restaurant concept from the man himself, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with your Uber Eats or Postmates app. Woo Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa in Alabama, with many more locations coming soon. Try the only chicken wings worthy of carrying the name of the 16-time world heavy weight champion tell him nature wings legendary flavors world championship wings woo woo wings yeah woo woo two pills did you know um what was going on in his real life i mean when you're making that car ride with him does anything come up about real life or is it all just wrestling i we didn't spend that much time together and i knew melanie I remember, you know, I liked Melanie. There was a time in WCW when we would run uh, uh, work Hollywood Studios, which was called Disney MGM Studios at that time. And so we'd all be at the same uh, hotel. I believe it was a Marriott, um, uh, the one where you stay, you know, it's got the living room. Uh, extended stay? Not extended stay. Uh, we'll come up with a name. Spring Hill Suites? It wasn't Spring Hill Suites. <laughs> I will come up with a name for it in post. I'll magically come up with the name. Uh, and then my wife and I started going to the beach and staying mm -hmm. at Cape Canaveral instead. Because she loved the beach. But for the time we were there, you know, we liked Melanie. I always liked her. My wife liked talking with her. And, you know, it was real, you know, she's not here anymore. Yeah. Maybe the greatest testament Brian's career is his son. You know, brought flying Great, Brian yeah. Jr. We we're rocking that mullet, brother. Maybe the best hair in the business. Maybe the best hair in the business, and a handsome young man. Yes. And uh, man, he he grew up under adverse circumstances, uh, but he aspired to. He's he's aspired to be like his dad without making some of the mistakes his dad made. Shout out to Aunt Linda. Yeah, man, what a what a great what story. a saintly figure she is, right? Uh, I'm curious, you know, you wrote in your book about how um, this brought about change, but you really leaned into it brought about change creatively. You say almost immediately all gimmicks were switched and guys became to an extent themselves. Gone was the stodgy rich persona of Hunter Hearst Helmsley to be replaced by a wise ass double entendre spouting triple H. The real double J was taken off Titan death row and was given new <laughs> life as the road dog. Rockabilly took off his bedazzled Kmart special jacket, <laughs> dyed his hair to its natural state, and became badass Billy Gunn. Rocky Maivia deep six his chia pet hairstyle and stereotyped ass kissing persona to become the rock. <laughs> Even Howard Finkel developed a bit of a tude. For some of the guys, it was too late. If Vader had come in right off the get go as a killer, he would yeah. have drawn big money. Oh, yeah. Instead, the cowardly Vader never really found his niche. I actually had a difficult time adjusting to the new Federation attitude, even though it would take several months for the biggest business to pass me by. 
catching back up would be one of the biggest challenges mm-hmm. of my career. For sure. But I do remember that as being what I consider the dawn of the Attitude Era. Mr. McMahon admitting that those, uh, what Kevin Nash would call, <laughs> you weren't a character, you were a, you were a job. Right? You're an occupational an gimmick. Occupation, yeah, occupational gimmick. And we could probably come up with a couple dozen if you have a few minutes. But sure. The Mountie, the Repo Man, IRS, the, you know. The dentist, the, the garbage yeah, yeah. man, the plumber. <laughs> exactly. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I did have some trouble uh, catching up. And I did have to do a little soul searching and, uh, you know, a little, I dropped a couple F bombs backstage when I didn't feel like crowds were listening because they were more into the, you know, the, the real the, stuff, the, the catch, the catchphrases. Oh, the catchphrases became big. Uh, and, uh, you know, not that I didn't have my catchphrases, but to try to supply <sighs> any heartfelt content kind of flew in the face of the attitude era for a while and then there came a time when they needed more and you know i was lucky i was one of those guys that was able to supply it but the, i remember that as opposed to that day as opposed to um the survivor series montreal screw job as be planting the seeds of the attitude era i think um it's been said that Bruce Pritchard said on his podcast when the interview, I don't know if you recall, but it was a taped show. Mr. McMahon wasn't there that day. Uh, and Hunter, not Hunter, but Sean had an in-ring promo with Jim Ross. And it was an episode where not only was uh, Vince not there, but neither was the undertaker, but they had a pre-recorded interview from the undertaker that they aired on the jumbotron and Sean knew it was pre-recorded. So he just, called him out and talked all kinds of trash. They cleaned it up in post, but during the interview, Sean had stuffed his shorts with something bicycle shorts and kept jumping up and down and crotch chopping Jim Ross in the face, drawing attention to his overstuffed (laughs) bike shorts. And they had to clean all of that up. And of course at first (laughs) everyone, yes. And everyone said it was unprofessional and blah, blah, blah. But when Vince saw it, He said, that's attitude. (laughs) And maybe that's where it all began. But that was on the March here to the, to the September pay-per-view. This is October. And this is where he admits to the, to the group and holds a meeting. But I'm curious, you know, was sometimes we, we hear about a loss and it's, and it, it creates conversation and it creates change. And with the loss of Eddie Guerrero, the company started to really change the way they were screening guys medically because Eddie died of a heart defect as well. And they felt like they should have known that ahead of time. So now boy, there's a much more extensive process to get cleared. We've talked about it on this program where you had a great idea and a great program and then you just couldn't get cleared. So it didn't happen. But then we had a, another instance a couple years later when Chris Benoit passed and that would have been 10 years after almost 10 years yeah, 97 to 2007. And now we started to do a lot more impact testing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we've we've just learned as we went along. Were there any changes to the business or improvements or lessons learned from the passing of Brian Pillman? Or was it viewed as a sad tragedy and we just moved on? I think that's when we started to see the Soma problem subside. I think there was... <sighs> Even though that wasn't attributed to his death. Yeah, it wasn't. It, but it People was just, still whispered. I mean, I remain you know, Undertaker laying into Brian about the Soma shuffle in public, you know, uh, looking out for his health, but also us as a group. And I remember one of those overseas flights, probably in uh, when we used to go to the Middle East in 97 yes. quite a bit, you know. To this day, I'm thankful that I was let out a day early so I could. Ma- I made it home from the Middle East 10 minutes before my kids went out trick or treating. Wow. So, Dewey trick or treated as Dude Love in one of the few outfits made by Julian Terry. Uh, and I went as Mankind with the rubber, cheap rubber Mankind mask, and not a soul knew that I was the real Mankind. Under That's there. fantastic. It was great. Um, but I think that's so. On the, one of those Middle East trips, I remember seeing guys and they couldn't even eat with you know their meals because their hands were shaking. It's like, man, this is a really strange world. Because when I was, I, guys wouldn't talk about 
what they did because I wasn't part of that. Right. You know, like I didn't, I understood people drank, but I didn't realize the extent of the problems they had. Right. Uh, because I believe at that point I'd only taken uh, uh, painkillers in 94 when I was, um, uh, um, when I was shoved off the ramp at uh, yes. uh, with the uh, sags and knobs, and then when I had the back injury uh, in '94, I believe uh, one of the guys gave me something to help me with the pain because I was just in a you know a, a world of hurt after my first ECW match uh, with a back injury. So this stuff was really, really, really new to me. And it was shocking to find out how uh, the amounts of medication that people were taking. Uh, I worked a really physical style, not as yeah. dude love, but as the other guys. And like I accepted uh, this is part of the deal. Yeah. But I also like I knew I say it was new to me, but I knew about deaths, drug related deaths, and I didn't want any part of anything that I felt could be addictive. I um I don't really want to in the show on a downer but do you have any good or fun or happy stories about brian you can share like when you think about brian well it's easy to think of the you know brian in his last days yes man you know the <laughs> at the end of brian's song where uh billy d williams is he says but man he says piccolo i think of brian piccolo and they show him running yes and then they freeze frame and there he is that's the way he's always going to be remembered by uh by gail sayers as portrayed by billy d williams well i'm going to choose to remember and i'm getting the you know i've been pretty emotional but i get the tingling you know him and him and austin as a team combining humor and you know just excellence that's the way i want to remember brian yeah as the guy who would go out who could make you laugh on his way to the ring and then he and steve would do that. yes <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> people don't even know what a movie camera is to you know is yes. today right but they go they make you laugh they then they go out there and tear the house down and then you could ride back and then you know have you in stitches you know it was really uh, there was a glass ceiling and we that uh motivated us and uh you know infuriated us but we had a lot of fun we were it was a good group of guys there and we didn't care we did care that there were 2600 instead of 15000 but by god all of us wanted to tear the house down it wasn't until the crowds were full every night that you started thinking about your longevity and saying hey this seventeen thousand people is going to be replaced by another seventeen thousand tomorrow and i've got to have something in the tank but in those old days it, it was there's was something i don't know almost romantic about putting it all out there every single night and i think brian and steve were a big part of uh you know they motivated us and pushed us because they were so good together. Well said. I hope everybody uh, takes a little time and goes and enjoys some of those great Brian Pillman matches because, boy, they are uh, plentiful. They are. Uh, probably the most famous is his against uh, Jushin Liger at Super Brawl. Great stuff. Uh, way ahead of its time. And it's, we're not allowed to show clips anymore, huh? No, I'll show you the paperwork. On that. <laughs> not even clips, but all right, let me appeal to the camera. It, it's going to draw people to the product, right? Yeah. yeah. I believe it does. Yeah. Benefits there's a, there's a backstory I'll tell you off here. Backstory? Here. Okay. But but okay. the gist is, it's on the WWE Network on <laughs> Peacock. Uh, go watch Super Brawl. I mean, that match, Mick, it, it, it's so far ahead of its time. It could take place this Wednesday on TV and people would still love it. Yeah, they sure would. And it was over 30 years ago. It was way ahead of its time. Uh, not to take away from anything that happens on Wednesday now. I think you get what I'm saying. I'm just saying it was um, before the Young Bucks and that style and the Daniel Bryan style mm -hmm. and the more modern style. Man, we saw the beginnings of that with Brian Pillman and Jushin Liger in a time when, you know, in 1991 and 1992, wrestlers looked and worked more like Hulk Hogan and Sid than they did. Oh, there was a lot of guys tackled drop. Yeah, you saw that in maybe three or four matches on a card. Yeah. You know, variations of this. And it wasn't like 
Pillman and Steve weren't doing double hip tosses, and sure. so, but they were putting their own imprint on it, coming up with their own their own moves as well. And really, it was. And then uh, Steamboat, geez, Steamboat, one of the you know, one of the great workers in our business. And then Shane Douglas is right there with him as far as being uh, a great tag team wrestler and an underrated you know talent overall. And if you're looking for something fun that Brian did, uh, I recommend the uh, the pencil promo from ACW, <laughs> and maybe one of the more underrated segments in WCW history, a flair for the old, uh, where they mocked oh, flair for the gold, and they started talking about a lot of antiques rolling around. Uh, Fantastic, uh, and stuff. that Arn and and Rick are looking around, not realizing the antiques are talking about our them them, yeah. <laughs> Go check it out, boys and girls. It's fantastic. It feels inappropriate today to plug Cameo, but you know what to do. Um, oh, yeah. Go on there. Yeah, I do a good job if you're celebrating some kind of special event. Cameo.com slash Mick Foley. And we have this show for Joe Doring, where 100% of my proceeds uh, will go, and we auction off the, the shirt. Uh, the shirt's off my back. So we're hoping to raise about 5000 or more on December 4th in West Chicago and that's at realmidfoley.com and we help to fill up that uh, community center and uh, make the world a little better place for mankind. Right here on Foley's Podcast. Yeah!